people have been asking me, what do I think about the new six-part documentary titled Who Killed Malcolm X? The documentary. The documentary Who Killed Malcolm X for me personally was like watching a horror movie. In fact, while viewing it, my emotions ran the gamut, varying by the minute from sadness, shock, disappointment, joy, hope, and anger. But the documentary indeed held my attention from the first episode to the last. You won't fall asleep on this documentary at all. But when you do go to bed, be prepared to toss and turn from what you hear and see. And like what Boris Karloff said about thrillers... Let me assure you, my friends, this is a thriller. Me acting as a film critic... This is what I didn't like about this film, or where I think the ball was dropped, or what I hope would be covered, or what I found sickening about it. Don't get me wrong, there are three people in the film who I thought were superb and stood strong for our fallen warrior, Malcolm X. They are Abdur Rahman Muhammad, Professor Zach Kondo, Brother Zaid Muhammad, there are many others who appeared in this film who, in my opinion, were despicable. The first thing noticeably missing from the film was any information on the man who taught Elijah Muhammad, known as Master Farad Muhammad, who later changed his name to Muhammad Abdullah, who reappeared in the Bay Area of Oakland, California in the 1970s after allegedly vanishing in thin air in the 1930s. The film fails to cover the cult's leader, and comes off as Elijah Muhammad being the originator. The issues that I point out here are not in any special chronological order, so bear with me. I'm just going to jump to whatever comes to mind. I remember a scene where three spent shotgun shell casings said to have been recovered at the crime scene were shown on screen. I was hoping that the camera's angle would have been much closer in that shot and the person holding the shells would have shown the viewer the business end of the spent shells to challenge the issues raised in my own independent underground documentaries. But let's move on. Those retired law enforcement people shown who were so casual in their expressions, who were so nonchalant about the required oppression of Malcolm and black people, sickened me to my stomach. But I'm not naive. Any group who put themselves in power must do the same. It falls under the category of maintenance. And that John Ali, a guy you just love to hate. There's a scene in the film where John Ali is crossing a very busy street and cars are zooming past him. I was hoping the cameras would have caught him being demolished by one of those vehicles. He safely makes it to the sidewalk, steps in a puddle of water, and I was jumping up and down, hoping he slipped and broke his neck. Nope, he survived. And then he eats some food I was hoping he choked on, but he survived. If you knew the role that Ali played in stopping Malcolm from entering the United Nations to start the ball rolling on getting you your reparations you would understand my contempt for him. Remember that famous scene from one of my documentaries where Malcolm is standing outside a Queens, New York courthouse factually stating that John Ali appeared on a Chicago radio show in June of 1964 called Hotline, hosted by Wesley South, that John Ali openly admitted over the air that the FOI was going to kill Malcolm? I was hoping the company who made this film would have went into the archives of WVON Radio and included the audio portion of that broadcast when John Ali made this murder admission. That would have been huge. What a big letdown. Do you see what I mean about this thing being like a horror movie to me? Do you want me to continue? Do you want to hear more? Or is it time for go to bed? Okay, let's continue. There are fools in this film who try to make it sound like Malcolm was some troublemaker who was instigating violence, who was challenging Elijah Muhammad's authority. Malcolm righteously believed in self-defense. And when you think about it, that in itself is humbling. Self-defense allows the other fellow to strike first. 
Malcolm only wanted to respond to brutality being heaped on us in 1965 and prior. I want you to be clear on something. If I was old enough to have assisted Malcolm, I would have joined his organization and ran past you so fast to help him. Your clothes would have been flapping in the wind. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I would have signed up to be on his security detail. Yeah, give me the Gatlin gun. Yeah, the one with the crank. I would have had it mounted on the stage, and the first clown that had a smirk on his face, I would have been cranking. That's how you should all feel about a man who was trying to get something for you. Now look at us in December of 2019. We ain't got shit going on. Nothing but a bunch of individuals bragging about their job titles and how much money they make. You call that progress? I apologize. I got distracted. Let me get back to this film review. Where was that photograph of Linwood X, author Peter Goldman described in his popular book, The Death and Life of Malcolm X? Goldman said he saw a photograph of Linwood X staring at Malcolm's body after Malcolm was shot, and that Linwood appeared to be smiling. Why didn't this photograph make it into this documentary? Who was Linwood X? Linwood X came to the slaughter along with the team of shooters who were all from New Jersey's Moss No. 25. No mention of Linwood X in this film? Lewis X isn't even mentioned by name in the film. Only newspaper articles of Lewis X appear on screen, but his name is never mentioned. I thought this documentary would have delved into the fact about Lewis X's strange visit from Boston to Newark, New Jersey, the day Malcolm was shot. I thought that this was going to be the big film that wasn't going to leave any stones unturned. I was also hoping that this big budget film would corroborate and back up what's in my small independent films about Minister James and Captain Joseph who were hosting events inside the Autobahn Ballroom before Malcolm was shot. This information put out by this award-winning film company about officials in the Nation of Islam being attached to the Autobahn Ballroom would have indeed cast doubt on that nonsense talk about that unsubstantiated gospel about Elijah Muhammad telling everyone, instructing everyone, to leave Malcolm alone. The Nation of Islam had many archivists so where is this recording of Elijah Muhammad demanding that no one is to lay a finger on Malcolm? Maybe someone has a real-to-real -real recording of Elijah's instructional speech to leave Malcolm alone. Check your old collection of 45s. Maybe it's on a vinyl album in a bin somewhere. Maybe the Leave Malcolm X Alone sermon is on compact disc. Maybe it's on a dat tape. How about a cassette? Maybe it's on 8-track. All the people who claim Elijah Muhammad said what he said present the proof. But we'll be patient. That Leave Malcolm X Alone recording is bound to pop up one day. Maybe this still photo is from the Leave Malcolm X Alone speech. Let's hire a professional lip reader to explain what's being said in this still photo. I was also puzzled about the film's omission of a Nation of Islam member named Clarence X. Gill. Gill was from the number 11 mosque in Boston. Gill was a very dictatorial captain of that mosque. Mosque number 11 was the mosque of Louis X. Clarence X. Gill was also the bodyguard of Muhammad Ali. Gill was wounded in the Autobahn after Malcolm's bodyguard, Reuben Francis, shot him, but Gill survived. The film should have covered Clarence X. Gill's role in Malcolm's assassination. Here's a photo of Clarence X. Gill in his later years. 
I was also hoping that the alleged deathbed confession, concrete proof information of Captain Joseph admitting that he firebombed Malcolm's house would also surface in the film. Rumor on the street is that Captain Joseph confessed to Spike Lee. I guess my expectations for this film were much too high, but I understand. It's a filmmaker's prerogative to include what they want. That's exactly why I make my own films. I just don't have the budget, resources, or team to take things further. Do you want to continue, or is it time for go to bed? Lobo, send them all to bed. But it's not time for bed yet. I'm not finished with this review. Let's continue. There were many hit teams in the ballroom the day Malcolm got shot. The main three teams that took action on the spot were Moss number 25 from Newark, New Jersey, number seven in Harlem, New York, and number 11 in Boston. Did they work together in their plans to snuff out the life of Malcolm X? Or did they converge on the Autobahn unaware of each other? You would be mighty naive if you think they planned independently. In fact, you should be dismissed right on the spot as a walking fool. I was also hoping that the film would have laid out the information, the proof about Malcolm's charge that Elijah Muhammad was being funded by H.L. Hunt the rich white Texan of the oil industry. That alone would have made this film a smoker. The makers of this film had the juice, the team to do it. I guess another company will have to do it. The year before he passed away, in August of 2005, I had the privilege of speaking to Benjamin Kareem, a top assistant to Malcolm X. I included in one of my documentaries what he said about a doctor who was in the third floor emergency room who worked on Malcolm that suddenly vanished. Nobody knew his name or anything about him. According to the second edition of Peter Goldman's book, The Death and Life of Malcolm X, on page 277, when Malcolm's followers rushed Malcolm to the medical center, the residents and interns of the clinic did a quick stab tracheotomide to Malcolm's throat so that he could breathe from the blood that was thickening around Malcolm's throat. Malcolm was rushed to a third floor emergency room where the usual heroics were performed. His chest was laid open so that his heart could be massaged. Decades ago, I interviewed a sister named Khadidra Canton who was an organization of Afro-American Unity and Muslim Mosque Incorporated member. She was present in the ballroom when Malcolm X was shot. She said this. Taking pictures, so they knew, and it took them almost 25 minutes to come from uh, that hospital over there, Columbia University, to get Malcolm. And when I got, when I got, when they came for him, I went with Betty. Jean went with Betty, and I told Jean went with Betty upstairs, I went another way because I knew how to go back upstairs and go to where they were going. When I got upstairs, I don't remember seeing Jean, but I know she must have been there. Betty was standing there out of it. And this detective walked up and said, I'm going in there and I want to, I said, no, you're not going there before she go in there because she's his wife. And I went in there, I pushed the door open and I went in there and the nurse was standing there and the doctor and they had opened up Malcolm's chest. And I said, did you get confirmation from his wife to open up his chest? She said, when, a, when, a, when this some type of uh, um, disaster happens like this, they have the right to do that. So I said, Betty, remember this. But I know she didn't. You know, I mean, how could she, you know, who, you know, who wants to know that your husband's chest is open, you know? And I walked out, and because and, 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 I left Reuben, I don't know, I think Jean was there, and walked on down and went on out. Because I knew was nothing else was going to be done. The brother was dead. If he wasn't there when he got there, he was dead when he left there. From the research I've done, this is a morgue photo of Malcolm before his autopsy. You know when the medical examiner, coroner, pathologist, necropsy technician makes that Y-shaped cut on your chest to retrieve any foreign matter that may have caused your death? This is the problem I'm having trouble with. If only a trichiotomy, that quick stab to Malcolm's throat was done to help him breathe, how do you explain where this cut on Malcolm's right chest area came from? If this cut was to massage his heart, 
You can't perform that task because the rib cage would block a human hand from going through the ribs to reach the heart. But a blade or knife could easily go through the ribs and reach the heart. Was Malcolm pierced in his side to assure his death? I had my fingers crossed, hoping photographs of the kill team from Newark's Moss Number 25 would be shown. The public seen the faces of Thomas Hayer and William Bradley, but where's the photos of Albert Benjamin Thomas, Leon Davis, and Wilbur McKinley? There must be a public school photo, junior high school, high school photo, driver's license, or even welfare card photos of these bums. How in the world did they manage to leave out Roland Shepard's story? a man who admired Malcolm. Roland Shepard is featured in many of my films, and Shepard's story about what he saw that took place before, during, and after the assassination of Malcolm will knock your socks off. The tragedy of it all is that Shepard was interviewed on camera for this documentary, but it all wound up on the cutting floor. Gene Roberts, in my opinion, received too much play in this film and Roberts comes off like a good guy. Gene Roberts was no good guy. It was Roberts who came over to Shepard, who was seated up close to the stage and told by Roberts that he had to change his seat. It was Gene Roberts who set up a reserved seat for the shotgunner, William Bradley. And that Muslim community in Newark, New Jersey, home of the killers, they were pathetic. For decades, they watched countless documentaries, saw Malcolm's killers, and stood idly by and witnessed black communities self-destruct worldwide because Malcolm's mission wasn't accomplished. And I'm supposed to consult them for wisdom? I'm supposed to look up to them as black men of higher learning with their neatly trimmed white goatees and beards? when over the decades never came forward, but instead sheltered, fed, and embraced the killers of a man who attempted to get something for all of us. I'm supposed to sit at their feet for under and overstanding? You talking about let sleeping dogs lie? Don't kick the doo-doo? We're supposed to rationalize some voodoo talk and dismiss a warrior's efforts? while you send off a killer like Bradley, like he was some hero? Is this what's going on in your town? You expect people to join the conspiracy of silence? We're supposed to honor Bradley because he ran a gym? All the dicker bees, koofies, and prayer rugs in the world will never compete with what Brother Malcolm set out to do. Look what went down in a town of New Jersey. Ours is not an easy age. We're like tigers in a cage. What a town without pity can do. Before I submit to that insanity, with a toothpick in my hand, I'd rather dig a ten-foot ditch and run through a jungle fighting lions with a switch. I'm still puzzled why Roland Shepard was left out of this documentary. Like I said earlier, Shepard's story will knock your socks off. He had a direct connection to Gene Roberts and William Bradley, Malcolm's shotgun assassin. This is a picture of him and his mugshot in East Orange, New Jersey. And this is a picture of him now I personally thank you, Roland, for having the courage to come forward and tell your account when many of Malcolm's own organization members were too afraid to say what they saw. Though I was given a thanks in the last episode of this documentary, I want to include your name. I know you think I've been very hard on this film, but I like this film and I highly recommend it. In fact, it's a must-see. You have to see this film. Very important film. 
Well, I'm getting a little sleepy now. So I think it's, it's time for go to bed. Lobo, send them all to bed. Time for go to bed. You heard the man. It is time for go to bed. But before you go, be sure to watch the six part, nearly six hour documentary, Who Killed Malcolm X? Regardless of my issues with the film, I give it two thumbs up. And so does Lobo. Yes, I was there when they crucified, crucified the Lord. 